Bonsoir, euh, merci à tous d'être venus pour ce 26e euh, Performance User Group avec euh, aujourd'hui une, une soirée spéciale à Camaï avec euh, deux sessions. Euh, ça va durer un petit peu plus longtemps, mais après il y aura toujours un, un impératif pour, pour continuer à discuter. Donc euh, je vais essayer de ne pas me tromper. La première session devrait être euh, Measuring Front-End front -end Performance by Garrett Hughes. Euh, Web Performance Enterprise Architect chez Akamai et la seconde session par euh, Tobias euh, about High Performance euh, Images euh, Petit message avant de commencer euh, on recherche toujours des, euh, des speakers et des personnes pour nous aider à, à trouver des speakers pour les euh, prochaines sessions donc si vous avez des idées, si vous voulez nous aider à, à améliorer le Perfug à contribuer au Perfug N'hésitez pas, vous êtes les, les bienvenus à vous rapprocher de moi, de Borémy ou, ou, ou de Benjamin durant le, durant le pot. Euh, et euh, petit, euh, petit message également du, du sponsor, on est chez Octo qui nous accueille et, et, qui, nous, et qui nous offre l'apéritif. On, on recrute chez Octo, donc si vous êtes intéressé par ces sujets-là, n'hésitez pas non plus à venir nous voir. Prochaine session euh, qui arrivera bientôt, dans à peu près un peu plus de 15 jours. À la semaine du, du 20 novembre. Euh, on va retourner sur la performance Java et on fera la communication dans les euh, jours qui viennent. Donc euh, restez informés, ça va, ça va venir vite la prochaine session. Voilà, je ne vous embête pas plus et euh, je, vous, je vous laisse tout de suite euh, entre, euh, entre deux bonnes mains pour euh, entendre parler de la performance front-end. Okay, bonjour. Thank you, Mark. Mark. Oh. Just bear with me while I try and get this up on the screen. Aha. Okay. So, welcome to Measuring front-end performance, what, when, and how. I'm afraid I'm going to have to speak in English because my French is not that good. So if I'm talking too quickly or you can't understand me, do shout, tell me to slow down. Okay, so as Mark said, I'm Gareth. I'm from Akamai Technology. I'm a enterprise architect for web performance. Okay. So let's start with the what. When we're talking about front-end performance, what are we going to measure? And really we need to think about more questions than that. We need to think about what metrics can we measure that are going to be meaningful to us as developers, as business owners, uh, that are going to tell us how our pages are performing for end users and what their user experience is like. So what do users mean when We have an Akamai study here from 2009 that said 47% of consumers expect a web page to load in two seconds or less. But what do they mean by load? Do they mean that the page is usable on a um, travel site, that the, they can start to interact with the search facility? Do they mean that all the objects on the page are loaded, all the third parties, all the tracking, all the analytics? Or do they mean when the browser wheel stops spinning? often a pretty good indication that something's still happening, that something's feeling slow if there's a, a browser wheel spinning. Can't necessarily always answer that, but what I hope to do here is help you to find out and know what you can measure to ensure that you're getting that user, or your users are getting that good user experience of a high performance, fast website. And I want to start off by looking at the anatomy of an HTTP request. So here we have a very basic request for a web page. <coughs> we start off with DNS resolution, turn that web address into an IP address. We then have to create the TCP connection, the TCP handshake. If it's a secure connection, we're going to have to set up TLS. We're going to have to go through 
certificate exchange, all that kind of stuff. And then we actually have to send the request to the server and say, this is what we want. That's all gonna be, that can all be put together and be called time to first byte. And that's going to give a good um, idea of how the server is responding to requests, how timely the responses are coming back to end users. And that's also going to take, take into account round trip times, latency, that kind of thing. And all of that's got to happen before we get the first response, the HTML. And we can time all that, we can measure all of those points, and we can measure time to first byte. So, once we've been through all that and we've got our HTML into the browser, what's going to happen? There's probably going to be some CSS to download, to give it some styling, otherwise it's a pretty boring page. From those, we're going to create the DOM and the CSS on. Document object model, CSS object model. Gonna, the b browser's going to build those in memory to decide how the page is going to look, how it's going to be laid out. Once those have been created, we get a marker for DOM content loaded, another measurable mark within the browser. They're going to combine and build a render tree. From that, the browser will create the layout and finally start to paint the page. And we get another timing mark in the browser, render start. So that's a pretty simplistic view. That's a very simple web page being built, displayed on the screen. But we've got our elephant, JavaScript. We've all probably got quite a lot of it in our pages. And what JavaScript's going to do is it's going to delay the creation of the DOM in the browser. And CSS on construction is going to delay JavaScript executing and therefore delay the DOM. And all of that is going to push the DOM content loaded event out within the browser. So suddenly, from being a very simple um, metric, DOM content loaded can become quite important to show us how that's being built, how the JavaScript is affecting that, and, and how that's going to delay page rendering and impact user performance. It's worth noting that in a lot of modern browsers, the um, browser will actually build a partial render tree and start to start to draw things before that, but it will, all of that will still delay the DOM content loaded event from, from firing, even if perhaps render start actually happens before that. Uh, it's still going to give us a good indication. And that's just because browsers are trying to work around the performance impacts of what we've been doing uh, in the HTML. Okay, so once we've got it in the browser, how can we start to measure those and some other points. Well, we've got a really useful API called the Nav Timing API. And here we have a, a diagram taken from the W3C spec, which shows all the timing metrics we can get. And most of those that we've talked about are in there. We've got our DOM content loaded. We can see uh, D DNS lookup happening, TCP connection happening, request happening. So that's a really useful place to go and start to get some of those metrics and pull them out of a page. We've also got a similar thing for page resources as well, the resource timing API. It's going to allow us to see how the performance of our CSS, image files, that kind of thing is doing. It's worth noting that this is subject to core security. So if you want to time anything cross origin, you, you have to make sure that it's got the timing allow origin header set. Um, nonetheless, very, very useful. Uh, and if it's possible to do that with third parties, a really good way to start to keep a track of what third parties are doing. For ultimate control, we've also got the user timing spec. And what that's going to allow us to do is, within the code, actually put our own timing marks into our measurements. Uh, and there's a partial, so just taken a part of a waterfall here for the Guardian, UK newspaper loading. Uh, and they use that, and you can see there that they've got user timing marks to show when their first party JavaScript app begins to load uh, and finishes loading. And that we're, they've instrumented that in the app, so it's actually the JavaScript execution in the browser. It's not taking into account network time. So you can quite carefully put timing marks in around 
the code and parts of the code that are important to you and your users. So speed index. Some of you may have heard of it, some may not. So what speed index is, is it's a way to measure the visual performance of a page to look at how quickly a page is actually displayed on screen. And I've got two examples here taken from the web page test site, which has got a really good, dis very long description with all the intricate details of the formula to calculate the speed index. Um, but it shows two pages loading, which start and finish at the same time. And we might look at a lot of metrics on those and think, well, they're very, very similar. But actually, the user experience for the top page load is much, much better than the bottom. And the way Speed Index is going to measure that is by taking the visual, how the percentage of the screen that is visually complete at each screenshot. They're actually taken every 0.1 seconds. It's um, made a bit smaller here. Um, and graphing that so that we get something similar to this. And we've got graphed on there the visual completeness for those two pages. So page A, uh, the blue line was our top page, and page B, the bottom. And what it shows us is that, as we saw from the screenshots, page A becomes quite complete quite quickly, whereas it takes page B a lot longer. Speed index is going to calculate the area of the graph, so effectively the time spent while the page is visually incomplete, and give us an index, a score based on that. So that's going to give us quite a large score for page B, showing that the user experience is quite poor visually, and a small number for page A, showing us that it's quite good. So it's a really good way to start to find out how quickly a page is getting from nothing to being complete uh, and, and how good the user's experience is of watching that page load. So back to the what. We've seen there's a lot of metrics that we can go out there and measure, that we can pull back. But what are we actually going to look at? And it really that answer depends on your application and hopefully you can uh, use some of the uh, user timing spec to, to do that. But what I like to start to look at in general is to look at response end from nav timing or time to first byte, which is going to start to give us an impression of, as I said, how the server is responding to our requests. DOM content loaded. Because it's a really good analogy for pages usable, it's something we can measure that at that point the page is probably going to be usable by an end user. Render start, first paint, great because that's the first time a user is going to go from having a blank white page to something on the screen. If that takes a really long time, the page feels really, really slow. Even if it comes in being com absolutely complete at that point, it's probably still not going to feel very good if it's taken a long time. Total page load. Now, a lot of people... It's being used less and less, but I still think it's really valuable because it gives you the idea of the entire page with all its third parties, warts and all, as we say in English, to, to, to see everything that's happened and be able to compare that like for like with previous tests. User timings, as I say, it takes a little bit more work, but it's that fine-grained control over finding out where the performance markers are in your page or in your application. And then speed index. You know, as I say, it's a it's a, a, a great score to see an overall visual user experience. Okay, so we know what we're gonna measure. When are we gonna measure it? Are we gonna go away, develop a site application? Put it into test and hope that it's fast. Hopefully not. Just using an example here of waterfall um, methodology. 
So when are we going to measure performance in that? So we said we're going to do it in test. Hopefully development as well. What about in requirements? Requirements uh, as a non-functional requirement in the, in the project. It's pretty common these days. Measure it in production once it's out there. Content changes on the site. We've got content editors adding huge images and lovely graphics. Marketing adding third parties more and more. And we must track this. We must have these referrals. Uh, so measure it on a regular basis in, in production. Um, and find out what that user experience is ongoing and, and be able to keep on top of it. Without that information, um, you're just not going to know. What about getting designers involved? Um, Brad, Frost, Brad, yeah, Brad Frost tells us, good performance is good design. And there are many, many articles out there talking about designing for performance. There's a book on it by Lara Hogan. But really, the, the, the point here is that Designing something to be fast from the beginning rather than trying to optimize it later, you'll generally end up with a better user experience. It's going to cost less to develop. It's also going to be a lot less of a headache for developers. And a good way to do that is to use the concept of performance budgets. There's a lot of information out there about it, but here are my key takeaways on performance budgets. So Start early, set some performance budgets as you would do any other bud budgets in a project. Often they start out vague, you know, the site must be fast for mobile users. As you go through design, they can be refined and put into more tangible, times, uh, tangible terms of it must load in under three seconds for a user on a 3G connection in Paris. And the idea then is to start, is to stick to those budgets and make sure that, the, that both design, development, everyone involved in the project understands what they are and that there may be trade-offs for putting in five fonts because it's going to slow the page down and if you do that, you're probably going to have to take something else out to keep within our budget. Uh, and it boils down to my bottom point there, performance is everyone's problem in the project uh, and, and performance budgets are a great way of doing that, of, of putting that, that culture into a project. So we come back to the question of when, and there is an easy answer to this, at every stage of the life cycle. Measure for performance, set performance budgets, keep performance in mind. But how are we going to do that? How are we going to measure performance. Uh, so we know what we're going to measure now, and we know when we're going to measure it all the time. But how are we going to do that? What are we going to use? Uh, what types of tools are available to do that? Uh, and I'm going to walk you through the main categories now uh, and use some examples on the way. So synthetic, commonly referred to as robots. In the most basic form, they're things like curl requests, which are going to measure those timing points we saw right at the very beginning, that basic HTTP request. Uh, and we also great tools for availability monitoring. We know that the, the page... Oh, hello. Not what happened there? Uh, availability monitoring, so knowing that the, the site is up and running, because they're more often than not, they're done from external points, uh, around the globe, uh, giving you a feel for both performance and availability from, from various locations. Doesn't tell us probably an awful lot about the user experience on the site, um, but they are cheap, often free tools out there, uh, and they're very, very easy to do, very, very easy to get the data back. Much better to start using real browsers. I'm going to say real browsers, I hate doing that, but real browsers. Um, more often than not, with uh, a monitoring solution, you're going to be looking at using emulated browsers, 
which are great because they allow tests to be done in a clean room lab type environment so that the tests are repeatable. One after the other, they're being tested with an identical browser on a, a known connection, that type of thing, rather than the vagrancies of running Chrome on Windows, which is, if anything like me, it's going to crash constantly. Um, and so emulator browsers allow uh, vendors to have that control. So we're talking about people like Gomez, Keynote, Site Confidence here, who are going to um, do regular performance monitoring, load the page, um, execute all the objects on the page, uh, and, and give that. And you're going to get a graph-based portal. You're going to get a lot of... Uh, I used to work for NCC selling this stuff, and we used to call it death by graphs because there were just so many in the portal. But there's a lot of really valuable information in there about how the site is performing. A lot of vendors these days will also do testing, will do testing in real browsers on real operating systems. These are typically more one-off type tests, uh, and we're going to look at one of the main tools in a second, uh, web page test, which you can see on the right-hand side. Many of you may have already used it um, if you haven't. It's a great tool, and it's free. Um, webpagetest.org, go and run a test uh, of your site from all over the world in real browsers, throttle a connection, uh, see what's going on. There's scripting in there. You can start to write scripts that are going to go through uh, authentication on your site, perhaps perform a search. Going back to my example of a travel site, you can go and do a search for a, for a holiday and, and see how, how it actually performs further through the funnel. There's an API allowing you to run tests uh, programmatically. Uh, there are tools out there which will integrate with CI environments, uh, so you can actually um, run, uh, run it as part of your test suite. Um, there's a really good tool called SiteSpeed.io, um, which, which us utilizes that API to run some automated performance tests, as well as uh, some other things which I'll talk about in a minute. There are mobile devices on there, real mobile devices, iOS, Android. Uh, they're all based in the US at the moment, uh, but uh, they're really, really good. They're often quite busy. You ha often have to wait for them. But it's open source. You can go and download web page test, set it up on your own server, have a private instance. You can put your own mobile devices on there. It's really, really easy to do. Uh, using web page test is a great resource. Um, O'Reilly Burke has got information on not just using web page test, but actually setting up those private instances as well. And even easier than setting up your own is about I think it's about 10 clicks on AWS, and you can have a global private web page test instance up and running in minutes because there's pre built AMIs on there. Okay, so that's synthetic. We've done our clean room testing. How do we know what experience our real users are getting, our actual users out there? And we know from earlier on there are APIs in the browsers that are going to give us all that great information. Um, and we, what we'd love to do is get that, all those millions of data points from our millions of users every day back and find out what they're seeing. That's where we need RUM. No, not the drink because there's too much data, but real user monitoring. Uh, and it works in a very similar way to an analytics tag. Uh, you pop a small piece of JS on your page, and it'll go and grab all those metrics from uh, nav timing API. Uh, many now will do the user timing marks as well, and pull them back to a portal for you. Make it really easy. So how do we interpret all that data? Uh, as I say, the report, every vendor will give you a portal. But with millions of data points, it's really, really hard. Um, and there are lots of examples of how to do it. These are just three. Um, because there's so much data, you're often looking at aggregates, uh, you're looking at averages, percentiles, things like that. 
So it can really take a little while to start to dig down into the important data, into, the, into what's going to be important to you. Some visualizations make it really easy. Top right there, we've got a, a nice map of the globe, and we've got uh, different areas highlighted in different colors to show what kind of experience our users there are getting. But let's look at our example there. We've got Mexico in red. So our users in Mexico are seeing page load times in excess of 10 seconds. On the face of it, that looks really bad, and we need to do something about it because Mexico is a really big market for us. But if we don't dive down further into that information and find out what's going on and why they're seeing that poor performance, we don't know. So three out of the air. Firstly, it could be our CDM provider is providing a really poor performance in Mexico and we need to go and beat them up about it. Could be that there's a, the main ISP in Mexico is having a really big issue at the moment and everyone's got terrible connections. Or is it because actually we've only had one data point in and it's from a user in the middle of nowhere on a dial-up connection or using a 486? We, until we get into that data, we don't know. We're just guessing. So some of the most powerful visualizations of RUM data are going to be histograms, as you can see uh, on the, the larger screenshot there, so that we can actually start to see, OK, some users are seeing a poor performance, but how many are there? And actually, in the case of this screenshot, we can see that the vast majority of users are seeing a pretty good experience. The, the curve is waved to the left, but we've got quite a long tail and that's where we need to start looking into the data and finding out what's going on down there and hopefully our one little man in Mexico is sat down there and, you know, and we, can, we don't have to worry about him too much. So other tools, as I say, SiteSpeed IA, uh, command line tool, it's really, really good. Um, it can either fire tests off to web page test and collate them back and give you a nice reporting interface for it. Um, it can run tests internally or from command line using PhantomJS. That's really useful on sites that perhaps aren't accessible yet to the wider internet if you want a quick performance audit. Uh, Perfbar. Now, this is uh, an interesting one. Uh, there's a little screenshot there on the right hand side. What Perfbar allows you to do is actually put those timing marks up there in the browser for users to see. And I know of uh, companies that will put this on their UAT environments so that testers, when they're looking at it, can see what's going on. They can see the timing of the page. Uh, and you'll see that some are green, some are red. And that's because you can set those performance budgets within the tag and actually highlight things that, that are breaching any budgets you have set. I know of one other customer who actually injects it internally for internal users of their live site as well. So their internal users are having this surface when they're using the live site. So that's a really, really useful one. Uh, and it's coming back to what I was saying earlier about making performance everyone's problem. If somebody sees that there's a problem, they can start to, to shout and scream about it. And hopefully, they're all going to be green, and everyone will say, yeah, our developers are wonderful. Everything's always green every time I open the site. Uh, I also mentioned earlier about some plugins for CI. Uh, almost all the um, CI environments that I know of have some kind of plugin for performance and will allow you to break builds based on uh, performance budgets, things like that. So the last part of how is reporting it. Um, and I said earlier that performance should be everyone's problem. And we want to show them. So we looked at Perfbar. But we've got a lot of data there. And we're probably going to use it to optimize the site, find areas to improve, hopefully get some nice situational performance optimizations we can get for, from the RUM data. But actually visualizing it in a clear, simple way is really good. Uh, one such tool is Speedcurve. Go off, do some tests, and it will present you back a really nice, user-friendly 
clear portal uh, set of graphs like this where you can do things like mark on, you can see the red line there of this uh, person's performance budget, uh, this is actually the weight of images on their home page, number of kilobytes of images. Uh, they've got markers on there for, um, for deployments as well. And this can all be built in a way that is designed for display on a big screen. Uh, so publicizing site performance to the wider audience within a business. Other ways to achieve that, Graphite, Splunk here, two examples of open, well, Graphite's open source, Splunk is commercial, uh, that allow you to pull in data from multiple sources. These are really, really good. Um, I, my personal favorite is, is using Graphite there with the, the Grafana front end on it, makes it really easy to build graphs. Um, but Graphite has so many plugins, you can pull um, Google Analytics data, you can pull data from run providers, synthetic providers, web page tests, um, and you can build graphs and dashboards with all those data sources together. So you, you can start to build a story of, okay, our performance is, is improving, and so is conversion rate and um, uh, bounce rate, things like that. You start to build those graphs and publicize those within a business, have them up on a big screen. Uh, you know, again, I know of a, a company in the UK who, who use Graphite to build a, a, a giant dashboard. It's on a 100-inch display in their call center showing a big, red a big red face if the site performance is poor, a big green face so that the, callers, uh, the call handlers know if they're going to start to get calls saying, I can't do this on your site, I'm having a problem. And also, if somebody rings up and, go and says they've got a problem, they can go, well, everything we're seeing is showing that it's all running normally. Could it be something you're in? That kind of thing. So it's that custom dashboard allowing you, as I say, to build your own story, publicize it, make it everyone's problem. So how? Synthetic, real user monitoring, don't choose. They're complementary products. Using either one alone gives a very narrow view. You're either not seeing what your underlying site is doing or you're not seeing what real users are experiencing. Report that data. Make it visible. Make it relevant to everyone that you possibly can. So in summary, what? Decide what metrics are relevant to your users. I've given you a good starting point, but there are tons of data points out there, and really only you can say for certain what's important to you. When are we going to do it? All the time. Every time we possibly can test, test, measure. And how? We've, I've shown you a bunch of tools. There are many, many more out there. Uh, there's just a very small group of them. Uh, and then report it. Make it actionable. Make it relevant. I want to leave you with a quote from Ian Malpass Etsy uh, from their blog entry. Uh, and this is their philosophy. If it moves, we track it. Sometimes we'll draw a graph of something that isn't moving yet, just in case it decides to make a run for it. And that's a really key point. Measure everything. Decide what's relevant, but measure everything, because you never know when that data is going to come in useful. Like I said, all that run data, we need to analyze it further. If we're not measuring it and we need to dive into it, then we could be stuck. Thank you.